Welcome again to Centerpoint Church. We are so glad that you are here today. And before we get into our message time, uh, there's something that is really important for our community over the next month. Uh, we are about to embark on a journey of prayer and fasting together. Uh, if you are in person on the table as you walked in, there was a prayer and fasting card. Uh, if you are watching us online, you can go to our website, Centerpoint Church. Dot ca and there is a link there you can download the prayer card uh, this is something that we really recognize more than ever that we need to focus some very specific and very special time and attention to prayer uh, it's interesting i am part of uh, not just a local church here and a ministerial my strategic peer network in our area uh, but I'm involved in some uh, mentoring through a church in Winnipeg, and, and part of my group is actually in multiple provinces. And it's interesting, on Wednesday, we started to talk a little bit about um, what we see happening in the North American church, what we see happening in our context. And uh, one of the pastors, uh, he's from Sri Lanka originally, he uh, has served in a number of different places internationally. And as he just talked, one of the things that he mentioned uh, is he kind of read actually a little bit of Revelation 12 for us. And so again, this was in my mentoring group. Uh, he took us to Revelation 12. And in Revelation 12, uh, we see this really strange picture of Christmas where, uh, where John sees Christmas from a cosmic scale. And uh, so, so often that's kind of where I've stuck this. Oh, this is just a retelling of the Christmas story with some cosmic proportions. But one of the things that he took us to is right in verse 17 of Revelation 12. It says, The dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. And, and Francis just said to us, friends, the dragon, Satan, is angry at all of those who are followers of Jesus. He is raging against the church. And so all that you're experiencing, all of the discouragement, all of the division, all of the, uh, the uncertainty, uh, this is normal because that's what happens when the enemy rages against us. He attacks in so many different ways. And we're just recognizing as a congregation uh, that we have experienced attack. We have experienced uh, the attack of discouragement as the pandemic moved through the first uh, year. And we've recognized as well that the enemy is really desiring that we would be a people who quit. I mean, that's really what we've recognized in the last six months is that the enemy just wants us all to quit. Stop reading your Bible. Stop praying. Stop meeting together. Stop going to church events. Um, you know, stop connecting with your neighbors. Just quit. Just quit turn on that Netflix, just go to work, head down, mind your own business, just quit following, quit trying to make a difference. And if the enemy can get us to quit, guess what? He wins. And so our desire through this time of prayer and fasting uh, is to say, okay, God, we are in the middle of a battle. We're in the middle of a cosmic battle. We recognize the enemy's desire is for us to quit, quit, and we're going to say, no, we are going to join with heaven's armies. And the interesting thing is, when you read through the book of Revelation, you know how it turns out. You know that Jesus wins, and you know that his victory, not only is it assured, uh, but I'm always amazed in Revelation 19 and 20 that the hosts of heaven's armies are arrayed in white. They're lined up in this epic Lord of the Rings style battle, but the army of heaven doesn't actually do anything other than watch as the rider on the white horse uh, destroys the enemy forces with the sword that comes out of his mouth. And so we want to line up on the side of the Lord of Heaven's armies. We want to line up on the side of Jesus. And we recognize that our battle is through prayer. And so on our card, what we're going to do is we have four big prayer requests for Centerpoint Church. These are things that we need to be praying about. We're desiring that God would give us a vision of what he has next for our congregation because we need wisdom for our next chapter. We desire that as a church body, when God gives us that vision, we would actively reach out and begin to follow him in it. We desire to have unity, creativity, and opportunity to reach out and impact our community with the love of Jesus. And we need the financial resources for our church to sustain growth and ministry. And if some of you are thinking these prayer requests sound kind of familiar, it's because honestly, this has been the journey that we've been trying to be on for the last 
four years. Every time we take one big step forward and begin to ask God for vision, uh, something has happened that's kind of derailed the process. Uh, We were getting very, very close to saying, okay, God, what's next for us? And then March 2020 happened, and we moved into a year of survival mode where we were just trying to make sure that we could get services back up and running, where we could follow him as we felt like God was leading. And so We are going to just continue to move forward. We know uh, that the pandemic is not just going to go away with the snap of the fingers. And so we're saying, God, what is it going to look like? What is next for us? The dreams that we thought we had in February 2020, it's not going to be the same. So God, what do you have for us? So that's the things that we want you to be praying for our church. On the other side, we recognize that many of you are carrying heavy loads as well. And sometimes you've never actually written them down and said, God, what is actually in my bucket? What are the heavy things that I am carrying? And so you have the opportunity on the back to say, you want to what? I'm looking for a new job or I need help in my relationships or I need help with this. And so on the back, that's your opportunity to say, Jesus, for the next month, I am going to pray three big requests and I'm going to trust that you have an answer for me. We've done this first top half on both sides before. What we're adding this, this, uh, this time that's kind of fun is part of what's happened with the pandemic is we've all kind of been pushed to our own corners. We've all been kind of doing our own thing. And so what we're recognizing is that we need to get people back together praying. And so we want you to pick a prayer partner. It could be your spouse. It could be a friend. It could be uh, someone that you know fairly well at the church. We would love you just to say, hey, I'm going to start praying with so and so maybe it's just going to be once a week maybe you're just going to show up a little bit early on sunday and you're going to pray with them or maybe you're going to stay after service and pray with them Uh, maybe you're going to pick up the phone and every day at three you're going to phone somebody and pray with them but our desire is not just that we would pray our big three and center points big three we want you to be praying those things with someone else then the other thing that we want to do is we actually want to have a a church prayer night december the 12th at 6 30. We want you to come. It's going to be in person. It's going to be online. We're going to have a concert of prayer. And our desire is to lift all of these things up to God and spend some time listening together. God, what do you have next for us? And then we're also going to do a church-wide food fast from December 7th to 9th. Now, December 7th is a fairly long ways away, and that's good because when we talk about food fasts, a lot of the time we got to just talk to a doctor and just say, hey, what, what do I have the capacity to do? Should I only eat vegetables for those three days? Can I actually forego all food? Um, Depending on what your health situation is, uh, December 7th is long enough away that you can plan for it. You can talk to your doctor and you can figure out, hey, what will my body let me do to fast? We want to be fasting together uh, from December the 7th to the 9th so that when we come on the 12th, we are prayed up, we are fired up, and we are ready to listen and hear from God together what he has for us. It's funny, Uh, every so often I will read Western novels, usually by Louis L'Amour, and what happens so often, uh, again, those novels tend to have sort of a good guy and a bad guy that is uh, culturally inappropriate now, Uh, but one of the things that happens so often when the wagon train is under attack is they circle up, right? They defend one another, they watch each other's backs, they form a defensive circle, and as I was thinking about that this morning, I was saying, hey, the church our church is under attack it's under attack by our enemy who wants to discourage us who wants to get us to quit and so now's the time to circle the wagons it's a time to look to see who's got your back it's a time to pray it's a time to seek god's face and say okay god what do you have next for us does that make sense nodding heads yeah are you fired up yes we have one month of praying and fasting and seeking god i'm very excited so if you did not get this on the way in Make sure you get it on the way out. Uh, Make sure you spend some time tomorrow even saying, God, what are my big three? And then phone a friend, find someone to pray with. We want to make sure that we are uh, not only praying for Centerpoint Church, we're praying for ourselves and we're praying for others uh, that we're doing life together. Okay, that's the announcement about the the month of prayer and fasting. Again, very excited for this. Uh, But right now what we want to do is we want to dive back into our Foundations series. For the last number of weeks, we've been sharing some foundational truths and spiritual disciplines to help us understand the spiritual journey that we've been invited into by Jesus. Now, in Romans 8.29, Paul writes about how we as followers of Jesus 
how we've been chosen to be conformed to the image of the Son. And that means, friends, that you are on a journey to become just like Jesus. And what we've been saying over and over again is that this is a process that you are actually called to participate in. You're invited by Jesus to unpack the suitcase of your soul. You're invited by Jesus to join him as he renovates and repurposes the home of your heart. And so our goal in this series has been to equip you with the ideas and the strategies that you need to experience that transformation work. Last week, we began to talk about sin and confession, and we looked at 1 John 1, 1 to 10. We talked about how Jesus has called us into the light to be a people of the light. And to be a people of the light, we must be ready to deal with the darkness inside us as we confess our sins to Jesus, who is faithful and just, to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We also need to be ready to walk in the light with others. When we walk in the light with God and others through confession and repentance, a big part of that is that we agree with God that what he calls sin is sin. And we turn away from those thoughts and actions and we ask him for the thoughts and actions that he has for us, that he wants for us. And so we talked about how we can know um, what we need to confess and repent as we live in the word, as we invite the spirit to search our hearts and to show us those things within us that need to change. And as we live in community, we are formed in community. So we talked about sin. Today, I want to focus on sin again, but this time I'm going to use John Mark Comer's language of the world, the flesh, and the devil, because I want to talk about how the enemy of our souls comes against us to deform us, to lead us away from the things of God. And I want to talk about the spiritual disciplines that God has given us to resist that deformation process so that we can experience the transformation God has called us into. So let me pray, and then we'll dive again into this topic of sin. Father God, I thank you that you are the victorious one. Uh, Jesus, right now you are on heaven's throne and you are not nervous. You see what's happening in our world. You see the fear. You see the discouragement. You see that message that we're being given over and over and over again to quit. But Jesus, you never quit. You were tested and tried just like we are, yet without sin. And when you had opportunity to uh, fight for, uh, to resist, to run from the purpose uh, that the Father had assigned to you, uh, you would not yield. You would not bend. Uh, you went to the cross of your own volition. You died for us so that we can stand in your life. We can stand in your victory. Uh, we can have forgiveness of sin because of what you did for us, Jesus. And so as we talk today again about sin, would you help us to recognize that uh, not only do you give us victory, but you are desiring that we would be transformed increasingly into your image. Would you help us to see the pull the world has on us? And would you also help us to see how you've given us those disciplines, those spiritual practices that we can be uh, conformed and transformed into your glorious image? Jesus, lead and guide and direct this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jen and I have been listening to the John Mark Comer podcast. Uh, he's got a book called Live No Lies, which we've referenced and which we'll reference again in this message. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is he's a fairly intellectual guy. And so as he began to talk about this process of deformation and conformation and transformation, uh, at first I found the whole thing very cerebral. And I wasn't 100% sure if I got it. But then I started to think about busting stuff and fixing stuff. And then all of a sudden I started to realize, okay, he's using fancy words, deform, conform, transform. But really he's just talking about busted stuff getting fixed and made right. And I got it because my dad is a retired shop teacher. For 30 years of his life, he trained students in welding and machining and mechanical safety and other mechanical practices. One of the interesting things that he did in his job and that continues to his day is he is known as the fix-it guy. He is often asked by people to help them fix things. And so when his students busted stuff, when fenders got torn off their trailers, when holes got punched in their engine casings, when frames got bent or broken, they would bring it to my dad and they would say, Mr. Pollock, you got to help us. Our stuff is broken. 
And he would repair, he would restore, he would fix, he would reform the metal into what it was originally designed to be. Because of hard use, these trailers, these engine casings, these uh, dirt bikes were deformed. They was busted. My dad repaired and fixed and hammered and bent and, and welded and heated and transformed and conformed these things back into their original purpose. And so we're talking today about being deformed by the world and resisting that process so that we can be conformed and transformed to the image of Jesus. And what I'm really trying to say is the world is trying to bust you. The devil, your own sinful flesh, and the world is trying to break you apart. And Jesus is in the process of putting you back together. He is heating things. He is bending things. He is repairing things. He's getting rid of stuff so that you can look more and more and more like Jesus. And so friends, we have to recognize we are in a battle. God's purpose for your life is that you would look more and more and more like Jesus. As Paul said in Romans 8, you've actually been chosen by God to look like Jesus. Sometimes, uh, especially when I was in my teens, I would think to myself, God, your plan is kind of stupid. That Jesus, the perfect son of God, was wandering around healing people, and then you took him away. Right? I mean, like, doesn't that seem kind of backwards? That the guy who could heal people and raise the dead is gone. Right? Again, kind of 16, 15, thinking these crazy thoughts. But then, as I began to understand God's purpose in sending the Spirit, is that one person localized in Palestine, Jesus, the Son of God, ascended to heaven. But from heaven, he sent his spirit to the church. And suddenly the church was everywhere and the church went everywhere, filled with the spirit of God, serving and acting as the hands and feet of Jesus, looking more and more like Jesus. There are Jesus people meeting all over Camrose, all over uh, Alberta, all over Canada, all over the world. Uh, It's actually really, when you kind of get it, you're like, okay, Jesus, you multiplied yourself dramatically. From one person in Palestine, there are two billion people that are trying to look more and more like you in this world right now. It's actually an amazing picture. And our job is to recognize, okay, I'm on a journey of looking like Jesus. I am to be the hands and feet of Jesus in my neighborhood at work, when I go to the market, when I go to the store, I've been called and chosen by God to be more and more and more like Jesus as I'm filled with the Spirit, as I'm serving on mission. And so we're to be transformed, but we have an enemy who seeks to deform us. We have desires within us that resist being conformed. They constantly try to snap back to their broken ways. It's funny thinking about that idea of metal. Um, so often, metal will spring back. That's, that's what spring steel does. It just wants to return to that original shape. And inside each one of us, we have desires that even when Jesus starts to bend them, they just want to snap back uh, to the way they used to be. And we live in a world that places relentless deformational pressure on us to simply exist in this world is to be deformed by the world of flesh and the devil and so we can't be passive friends we have to be following the path of jesus we have to be allowing the holy spirit to lead us out of that deformation and into the transformation into the becoming more and more and more like jesus that's the basic idea behind john mark comer's book live no lies Uh, He wrote the book to equip the reader to recognize and resist the three enemies that sabotage your your peace and seek to deform you. Those three enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And what I love about John Mark Comer's work is that it gives us this real insight into that spiritual battle that we are in. And it also helps us to see the way these three forces work together to trip us up. It begins, John Mark Comer says, with the devil who influences us with deceptive ideas that then play to the disordered desires of the flesh, that sinful part of our nature, that are then normalized in the sinful society that we live in, i.e. the world. And so the deformational pressure from sin arises from deceptive ideas that play to the disordered desires in our lives that are normalized in the world around us. And I want to show you this pattern from uh, Genesis 3. 
Because in Genesis 3, we actually see this pattern at work. Adam and Eve, as they uh, they experienced these pressures, it led to the first act of sin and rebellion against God in the garden in Genesis 3. And from this original sin, all of humanity experienced the deformation of sin and brokenness. And so I want to lead you through that story so that you can see these three enemies at work. Remember, it's the devil, the flesh, i.e. the disordered desires of your heart, and the world. Now, to understand what happens in Genesis 3, You first need to understand Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1 and 2, God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates the land, the sea, the animals. And then as the pinnacle of creation on day 6, God creates humanity in his image. We have a capacity to know and be known. We have a capacity to love and be loved. And God places these first humans, Adam and Eve, into a wonderful garden which provided for their every need. He blessed them. He told them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, eat of every green tree and fruit-bearing plant. And then at the center of the garden, he placed a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he told them, do not eat of that tree. Now, some might wonder, why would God put a tree in the garden that they were not to eat from? Have you ever had that question? Why was that stupid tree there? Right? I mean, it seems like one of those things where you think, that probably shouldn't have been there. Maybe a better fence should have been around it, one of those cool laser grids that we see in the TV shows, right? Now, what's really interesting is in my weekly mentoring, we actually just finished a lesson asking that question. And Pastor Ray put forward a unique idea. His idea was this, love requires choice. So your computer, most of us have computers, uh, most of us have cell phones. A cell phone is honestly just a super fancy computer. Uh, It has more technology than a lot of the computers I had growing up. Uh, Your phone cannot love you, right? We all would say, yes, we believe that to be true. Uh, Your computer cannot love you because your computer is programmed to simply do what you ask it. If I open up my phone here, um, I don't know if you knew this. This is actually a Pokestop in the game Pokemon Go. And so I can open up, I can open up my Pokemon Go and my phone goes to Pokemon Go, right? It just does exactly what I tell it, uh, what I tell it to do. It just does. Sometimes you have to reset it because it breaks and then doesn't do what you want it to do. But my phone can't love me. I actually need to turn this off. It'll distract me if I keep this on. So (laughs) my phone can't love me because my phone is simply following its program. But friends, guess what? God didn't make us computers or robots. He didn't make us to blindly follow code. He made us capable of love, but to be truly capable of love means that we have to be able to choose. We have to be able to choose to act lovingly. We have to be able to choose to act unlovingly. Choice means that we either can follow God or disobey God. And so in the center of the garden was a tree, and that tree gave Adam and Eve a choice every day. Every day when they walked by that tree, ignoring it, they were making the decision to love God and follow his commands. But the longer they lingered by that tree, the more their priorities got a little bit out of of whack, and the more they were flirting with, would they keep loving God? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how many times they chose the path of love, walking past the tree and ignoring it. It doesn't give us any sense of time. Instead, as the curtain opens on Genesis 3, we see a serpent more shrewd than any other animal in the garden. And one day, this serpent asks Eve a question. Did God say you must not eat the fruit of any tree in the garden? Now, it goes without saying that this is no ordinary snake. We see throughout Scripture that this one is called Satan, the devil, the accuser, the deceiver. Jesus called him the father of lies. And in that Revelation 12 passage that I referenced, uh, he is the dragon. He is the one raging against the followers of Jesus. And here in the garden, he begins a conversation with Eve. He, He comes as something kind of innocuous. I mean, Adam and Eve's job in the garden was actually to name and take care of all the animals. And so for them, animals coming and going, it wasn't a big deal. I don't think very many of them actually talked with them, but this seemed to be something that was kind of under their control because it was an animal. But 
It starts this conversation and it begins, Satan begins the conversation with a very deceptive question. Remember, they were given permission to eat of every fruit bearing tree except one. And Satan comes along and says, has God really forbidden you from eating from every tree? Like, are those bananas off limits and those mangoes, are they off limits? Are the apples off limits? Like, like God kind of didn't let you touch any of that stuff. And Eve comes and says, no, 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 that, that's not the way that works. We're allowed to eat of every tree, except there is one that he's held back. We, we can't eat or touch the one that's in the middle or we're going to die. At that point, the deceiver again tells a significant lie. He says to Eve, you're not going to die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. Friends, the battle against sin begins in our minds. Here, the liar comes to Eve with a lie. God's been holding out on you. His plans are not the best plans for your life. If you take this fruit and eat it, you're going to become like God. You'll better yourself. You will achieve self-actualization. You will be your best self now. It's a lie. It's deceptive. And as we see in the next verse, this lie begins to play on some disordered desires in Eve. For one reason or another, even in a garden with access to every food item imaginable, even with the presence of God and the blessing of God and fellowship with others, even with all of this incredible goodness, there still seems to exist within Adam and Eve some idea that, that God has been holding out on them. This promise that they can become like God is something that they want to grab onto. They want more. They want more than what God has assigned for them. They want to become like God. And so convinced by the deceptive ideas of the servants, playing on those disordered priorities in their own hearts that they would become like God, Genesis 3, 6 says this. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, but not in a good way, not in the way that they had hoped. Instead, they saw their rebellion. They saw their betrayal. They experienced shame. They experienced broken relationships between God and one another. It's interesting when God uh, approaches Adam and Eve and begins to have a conversation with them, we see that they move into blame shifting mode right away. I mean, Eve blames the serpent. God blames, or, or Adam blames God. The woman you gave me, God. It's not my fault that I ate that fruit. It's your fault. You put her with me. And so this is on you, God. It's not my sin. It's your sin, God. I mean, that's how broken the logic gets. That we would actually blame God for our rebellion against God. Friends, this is how it works. And not only did they experience that fall, but all of creation was subject to a curse. Its very purpose was thwarted by the fall of humanity. And this caused a cycle where the brokenness of the world increasingly reinforces the lies of the devil and plays into the disordered priorities of the human flesh. And so Satan comes and whispers lies to us. Those lies sound good. They feel good. They play within the way that we feel those disordered priorities. And then the world comes along and says, yeah, if it feels good, do it. And when we join in with those lies, when we say yes to those disordered desires, when we go with the flow in our broken world, we experience the deformational effects of that sin. James talks about how there's this progression in sin. In James 1, 13 to 15, he writes this. Remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, those disordered priorities, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Friends, the lies of the enemy play to the disordered desires of the flesh, 
That's reinforced by the reality of living in a broken world which puts the stamp of approval on things that are contrary to God's law. This is the battle. This is the reality. So how do we stand against it? Uh, it's funny. I, I often picture this whole idea of deformation kind of like a blacksmith, right? A blacksmith has this chunk of sheet metal and he's pounding on it. Uh, he's got it over a sandbag and he's trying to shape it. So Satan your own disordered priorities and the world is pounding on you on the one side. How do we resist that while allowing Jesus to conform and transform us more and more to his image? To become like Jesus, we got to get pounded a little bit. We need to let Jesus do that pounding and do that shaping while we resist the pounding and the shaping of this world. So how do we resist? How do we become more like Jesus? Here again, John Mark Homer's book is very helpful because he talks about how our battle in our battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, we need to resist and allow Jesus to bring transformation into our lives as we uh, stand in each of these areas. And he says that spiritual disciplines are spiritual warfare. The practices of Jesus are how we fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. If you want to be conformed to the image of Jesus... If you want to resist the deformation, then you need to be following the way of Jesus by following the practices of Jesus. And so, there is a liar that is coming after your mind with lies. How do you resist that? Well, to resist the lies of the devil, we talked three weeks ago about the importance of tending to our thought life. Using Romans 12, 1 to 2, and Philippians 4, 8 to 9, we talked about how we need to experience the transformation and recreation of our minds. We need to fix our attention on those things that are true and right and lovely and excellent and admirable and praiseworthy. Moreover, we need to actively identify the lies we believe about God, ourselves, and others, and we need to learn to talk back, to confess and replace those lies with God's truth. Friends, Satan is constantly coming against us with lies. Lies about our value. Lies about our purpose. Lies about the meaning of life. Right now, like I said, I kind of feel like the lie that he's coming against a lot of us is, is it would be better if you quit. If you just quit, things would go smoother. And that's a lie. God has not called us to quit. And sometimes, as Eve experienced and as Jesus experienced in Matthew 4, these lies sound so close to the truth that it's easy to be convinced. I remember studying the temptations of Jesus in Matthew 4, and I really couldn't figure out why Matthew 4, why the very first temptation was something that Jesus said no to. It seemed like something that made sense, like Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. He's like starving. The human body really doesn't have a lot more capacity to survive after 40 days. We can do a lot, but 40 seems to be kind of like getting near the edge. And turning stones into bread kind of sounds like it's not a big deal. There's no commandment, thou shall not turn stones into bread, you know? And so I, I didn't really know what was going on, but Jesus knew. He said, no, man shall not live on bread alone. And Jesus knew the truth, and he knew how to recognize the truth from the lie. He knew how to uh, stand against the lie, to rebuke them and stand on the truth. Do you know how you can learn to differentiate truth from lie? Do you know the easiest way to do it? You got to learn to recognize truth. You have to dive into the truth. It's interesting when they trained people to recognize counterfeit money, they don't actually start by showing them all the different ways to counterfeit money. When they want to train people to recognize uh, true bills from false bills, they start by showing them true bills. You handle real money all day, every day. You feel what it feels like. You get a sense of the weight of it. You hold it up to the light. They show you the real money, and they show it to you so much that the second you touch the fake, you just know that it's fake. You handle the real money, the real currency, the truth, so that you could recognize the fake more and more and more easily. In 2005, I was working at a staple store in Calgary, and at that time, credit cards were to be swiped by the cashier. People would give us their credit cards, we would swipe it through our machine, they would sign the slip, and then we'd compare the back, and we'd look at their driver's license, we com we compare all the different signatures. 
And so every shift, I was swiping dozens of credit cards. Over my time at Staples, I probably swiped thousands of credit cards. And one day, someone handed me a card as they were trying to purchase a projector, and the second I touched the card, I mean, I've been working for probably four hours. I mean, you're kind of a zombie at that point, but the second I touched the card, my spidey sense was tingling. Everything kind of slowed down. I got some tunnel vision, and I looked at the card, and the second I looked at it, I could see all of the things that were fake about it. The color was wrong. The plastic was wrong. The numbers were punched through wrong. The magnetic strip was too big. Uh, the signature card was wrong. The hologram was defective. Everything about this card was close, but it was wrong. I called over my manager. I honestly can't remember what happened. To be perfectly honest, a lot of the times, um, the, uh, the store policy is really not to make a scene. It's to kind of, if the transaction goes through, you let it go through, they call the police, they start a file and they hand it off to a loss prevention person. So I really, like, it's not like I got in a fight with this guy, but the second I touched that card, I knew, okay, we gotta flag this transaction because everything about this is wrong. Friends, that's the way we need to live. We need to spend so much time with Jesus in quiet contemplation and meditation. We need to spend so much time in his word that the second a lie pops into our mind, we can recognize, hey, you want to what? Th that one's not right. I don't know what it is about that one that's not right, but I'm not going to stand on that. I'm going to hold that one up to the light for greater examination. And so friends, we need to recognize Jesus. We need to learn to recognize his peace, his values, his truth. As we do, it gives us greater capacity to stand against the lie. To resist the devil, we need to spend time with God in his word and through prayer. The story at the very beginning of John Mark Comer's Live No Lies book is about this monk named Evagrius who goes into the desert to do battle with Satan. It's a super cool uh, idea. Uh, I mean, this is like 400 years after Jesus, but 1,600 years from us. But even this monk, all by himself in the desert, managed to track down 500 errant thoughts that were trying to take control of his mind. There were 500 lies that were coming at him that he began to, he wrote them down and said, hey, this is a lie. And then he would write down the truth and anytime the lie would pop into his head, he would talk back to it and he would say, actually, this is the truth of Jesus. So if a monk in the desert, 1600 years ago, before the internet, before Facebook, all by himself, if he could identify 500 lies in the operating system of his brain, can you imagine how many we have trolling around in there? Can you imagine how many wayward thoughts you have that are not of God? It, it, it's got to be at least 500. And we need to learn to recognize them, not by focusing on them, but by focusing on the truth of Jesus. That's how we resist the lies of the devil. We focus on Jesus. We spend time with him. To resist the disordered desires of the flesh, as we talked about last week, we have to learn to confess and repent. We have to learn to bring our sin into the light. Honestly, what this comes down to is we have to admit that we have disordered desires and we have to be ready to admit those disordered desires to God. On Monday and Wednesday, I was here at the church with our Soul Care small group and we were watching the Rob Reamer talk on confession. Now, one of the things he said as he was talking about two of his heroes of the faith is he talked about how they were almost petty in their writings about their own sin. And by that he meant they were so aware of their disordered desires that when they had a first thought towards sin, they were quick to acknowledge it, confess it, and share it with the community. Long before it ever materialized, even as a temptation to start to drag them away, while it was still a, desire, a, disorder, a disordered desire, these men brought it into the light. Friends, I wish that we in the church had that same kind of self-awareness. I wish that we had that same kind of pettiness about our thought life. That as we wrestled with and began to think about the things that we were fixated on and focusing on, as we began to acknowledge the desires of our heart, uh, that we would say, hey, wait a minute, that one is out of order. So often... We find ourselves in a dark place, far from God, far from others, and we wonder, how did it come to this? How am I suddenly cheating on my taxes or stealing from someone or cheating on my spouse? How did it come to this? 
How is it that I'm doing things so far from God, so far from my values? And the thing is, it's not generally one big step. Usually it's a thousand small steps where we give in and follow along with our disordered desires, where we say yes to those desires and no to the life that God has for us. Can you imagine? Pick any heist movie, The Italian Job, uh, Oceans 7, 8, 11, or however many different iterations there are of that movie. Can you imagine if somewhere very early in the movie, one of the characters suddenly had this awakening thought, you want to what? I have a disordered desire for money. I am really wanting the million dollars I can steal from that casino, but you want to what? I don't think that's actually what God has for me. You want to what? I should probably tell God that I am doing this all backwards and I should uh, confess that to him and I should repent and I should get back to that place where I can trust God to be my provider. Can you imagine how lame that movie would be? Right off the bat, the guy goes to church, he falls on his knees in front of the cross and says, God, I've got these disordered desires. I just want to steal from that casino, but I know, God, that's not the plans and purposes you have for me. I'm going to trust that you're going to get me the right job in the right time. I'm going to live for you. Walks out the door, credits roll, right? The problem is, that's not the way most of us are living. We're having those disordered desires. Man, I just need to steal from that casino. And then we go about making plans in our minds to steal from that casino. We, never, we may never get to that place where we actually steal, but in our minds, we're, we're running, those, we're running those, 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 uh, those plans. We're making that stuff. We never recognize, wow, this desire is out of order with God, and I need to bring that into the light with him. Friends, the journey of confession is to, is to recognize, wow, my, my priorities are all out of whack. One of the reasons why Jesus says that the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He says that because those are the two priorities. That's number one and two. God first, love God with everything, love people as myself. Any other desire is kind of out of order. If if I want stuff for me more than I want to share, more than I want to care, more than I want to love, we got a desire out of order. We need to put it back into the right place. And so confession is huge for helping us to resist these disordered desires of the flesh. But this is also a very good place where we can engage the spiritual discipline of fasting. In fasting, as Richard Foster says, we discover the appetites that control us. When we actually say no to food, we begin to discover our disordered desires, and this discovery then allows us to choose to surrender those appetites to Jesus, and we discover that he is really all we need. Jesus, quoting Deuteronomy, declared that man shall not live on bread alone, and we were created to walk in fellowship with God to require him of necessity. I remember the first time I went more than 24 hours without food as part of a fasting experience, a spiritual fasting experience. Uh, It was so hard to break that glass ceiling. It was so hard. I I honestly thought that I was going to die, even though nothing biochemically was wrong. I mean, I hadn't even begun to tap into my fat layers, right? I mean, I can go a fairly long time without food because in North America, we just have so much. But all of the other desires, all of the other pressures were coming at me. It was a battle. But when I made it through that first day, suddenly I began to understand, oh, wow, God is really the number one thing. I just need to keep coming back to him. And so fasting trains our bodies to not get what they want. Since the flesh comes at us with these disordered desires, fasting teaches us to say no to our wants and yes to God. Rob Reamer, the author of Soul Care, he often has people come to him with addictions. And one of the things that he will recommend to those who are wrestling with addictions is he'll say to them, hey, if you can undergo a two-week fast and prayer, if you can make it two weeks fasting from food, seeking God, the power of that addiction is often broken in their life. I mean, it's a powerful discipline, but it's a hard discipline. And again, For many of us who have medical issues, a fast needs to begin with a conversation with a doctor. But it's an amazing way to reorient, to reorder our desires. And I'm really excited to see what happens uh, during our corporate fast from December 7th to 9th. I'm excited to see what God does in and through us as we give that time to him. And it is going to be hard. The funny thing is, 
is a three-day fast is actually the hardest. I've been told that when you roll into the fourth day, uh, you've kind of got rid of all the toxins that accumulate uh, from all of our processed food. Uh, as you roll into day four, uh, you've kind of dealt with all of those disordered desires, and so suddenly you're kind of humming on all spiritual cylinders. And so the people that fast say days four to seven are the money days. After you move into eight, your body is starting to break down the muscle. It, it becomes less fun again. But day four to seven is kind of that, that, that golden time of fasting. And I only picked a three-day fast for us, so we're going to get all the hard stuff, friends. Unless you want to start earlier. Totally up to you. If you want to start Sunday and say, hey, you want to what? I'm, start, I'm fasting Sunday to Thursday. Again, talk to a doctor first, but uh, I'm excited to see what God will do as we say, you want to what? I'm going to put you, Jesus, ahead even of food. We resist uh, the disordered desires of the flesh through the practice of confession and fasting. Finally, we live in a broken, sinful world that is constantly pulling us away from God. And we can resist the lure of the world by partnering together in community. Friends, it is hard to be a Christian. Jesus said of following him in Matthew 7, uh, 13 to 14, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. Friends, the pull of the world is to hop on the highway, to embrace all that is deemed good by our society. Comer writes of the world that the world acts as an echo chamber. It feeds into our disordered desires and it allows us to assuage any guilt or shame and do what we please. As a result, evil is often labeled as good and good is called evil. And in this atmosphere, the soul and the society devolve in a reign of anarchy via the loss of a moral and spiritual true north. Now, that is a fairly complicated statement, and it seems super negative, and that's because it is. In the North and West, we're living in strange times where some dark practices are not only tolerated, but they are celebrated, and any dissenting voice is crucified as intolerant. That, that's the world we live in. These are hard times to live in, and to be honest, here in Camrose, we, we live in a bit of a bubble. We are probably 10 years behind some of the other major cities on our continent, okay? I mean, when we talk with some of the people, there's stuff that we can do here that friends of ours who are in other cities in, uh, in BC, in southwestern Ontario, in, in the States, like we can do stuff that they would have no idea that that was, that was 20 years ago they could pull off stuff like that. But the exciting thing is, as Comer writes, in such an exilic moment, as we increasingly wake up to the reality that we are in a post-Christian world, the church in this atmosphere can act as a counter-anti-culture and a loving minority, as a creative minority. We can love the world around us from the margins, but friends, we won't be able to do it alone. We need one another. We need community to help us resist the pull of the world, and we need the community to be able to be salt and light to the world around us. While pre-Christian and post-Christian worldviews are not the same, what they have in common is they want to do life without God, without his rules, without consequences. But in a post-Christian worldview, there's still this desire for love. There's a desire for equality, for people to sacrifice for the good of others. But without God, it's really hard to love. It's hard to sacrifice. It's hard to share. There's an ancient document uh, it is a letter from a Roman governor, I believe to the emperor, if I have the right document in mind. Uh, but basically, what, what the, the emperor and the governor are writing back and forth, they're trying to figure out what to do with these Christians. And the governor decides that the best course of action would be, you want to what? We just need the state to outlove the Christians. The Christians are doing all of this really good stuff. They're taking care of the sick. Uh, they're sacrificing and feeding the poor. Uh, they're giving clothes to the needy. They're just doing all this loving stuff. And this governor says, you want to what? We got to try to outlove the Christians. If we can just take care of people better, then people won't bother going to the church. They'll come to us. And the thing is, without that recognition of eternity, without that desire to follow God, it's hard for the state to out-love Christians. And so 
in this Roman pre-Christian context, the state was not able to out-love Christians. In our post-Christian context, those values are still really important. Uh, love, equality, sacrifice, trust. These are things that our society desires, that we would be a place where there is room for all. But again, the motivation has been disconnected from God, and so the power to love sacrificially, the power to include others, it's also been separated. And so friends, in the church, we can still do it better as long as we're actually seeking God, as long as we're actually empowered by God. And so the church, our church, as we gather together and pray and seek God's direction, we're going to have opportunity, even in a post-Christian culture, to draw people away from the broad highway to the narrow way of Jesus through love, through sacrifice, through humility as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we're giving away that which has been freely given to us. Friends, you have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. These enemies are banging against you, seeking to deform you, to dent you, to drive you away from God. These enemies are working within you to tempt, to lead you into sin, but God has given you a way to resist. He's given you spiritual practices that are spiritual warfare. Through these practices, we not only resist the deformation, but we are transformed increasingly to become like Jesus. We need to be spending time in the word and in prayer, listening to God's voice. We need to practice confession and fasting, walking in the light as he is in the light. And we need to gather together in an anti-cultural community of love, sacrifice, and service. This is the call of God on our lives. This is what we will be contending for together as we enter our season of prayer and fasting. This is the essence of of what these big four prayer requests are about. God, make us that kind of community that is transformed into your image. And here's where you get to put your three things. God, I need transformation in this area. I'm worried about my finances. I, I, I have a terrible relationship with my boss. God, I need you to fix me, to fix this situation. God, these are my needs. Help me to be conformed into your image. Friends, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have come, that we might have life and have it abundantly. We thank you that you have come, that we would be transformed increasingly into your image. And I pray that you would give us your grace this week to step into these spiritual practices, to spend time with you, to listen to you, to learn from you, to meditate on you and to hear your truth. Father, give us the courage to uh, recognize those disordered desires within our hearts and to confess them to you. Father, I pray that you would even speak to us this week about fasting, about drawing close to you through sacrifice. Father, I pray that you would also help us to live in community. It is hard. God, the community that you are calling us into is tough, but there's no other way. You have given us this. The church is your church. We are your bride. We are being transformed. We are being clothed. Uh, you are purifying your bride. And so help us to live for you. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to us uh, during this season of prayer and fasting to step into the things that you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.